on one of the last nights of World War I, a young British soldier, Lieutenant Wilfred Owen, took refuge from the shelling in the cellar of a bombed outhouse. Owen and the soldiers with him were in high spirits, for there was finally hope that they would live to see the end of the war. My dearest mother, so thick is the smoke in the cellar that I can hardly see by a candle twelve inches away. And so thick are the inmates that I can hardly write for pokes, nudges and jolts. On my left, the company commander snores on a bench. It is a great life. I am more oblivious than the less, yourself, dear mother, of the ghastly glimmering of the guns outside and the hollow crashing of the shells. I hope you are as warm as I am as serene in your room as I am here. I'm certain you could not be visited by a band of friends half so fine as surround me here. There's no danger down here, or if any, it'll be well over before you read these lines. At 11 o'clock, on November 11, 1918, the war ended. One hour later, in the English town of Shrewsbury, there was a knock on the door of this house, the home of Tom and Susan Owen. As their neighbors celebrated the end of the war, the Owens were handed a telegram. In the war's final week, their son Wilfred had been killed in one of the last assaults on the German lines. Today, Wilfred Owen is known as one of his nation's greatest poets. The loss of such a promising life was a tragedy. And yet, he was just one of nine million people killed in World War I. Of all the questions, these come first. How did it happen? And why? The British soldier and poet Wilfred Owen witnessed one man's death from gas poisoning. In one of his most famous poems, he captured another dimension of total war. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. January 
1917. My own dear mother. Since I set foot on Calais Keys, I have not had dry feet. We were let down gently into the real thing. Mud. It has penetrated now into that sanctuary, my sleeping bag, and that holy of holies, my pyjamas. I chose a servant for myself yesterday, not for his profile, nor yet his clean hands, but for his excellence in bayonet work. I censored hundreds of letters yesterday, and the hope of peace was in every one. Wilfred Owen was a young poet just finding his voice when war broke out. He marched off to battle with a romantic view of war common among the young. Oh, meet it is, and passing sweet, to live in peace with others. But sweeter still, and far more meet, to die in war for brothers. The English officer class came to the war as innocents. It was a frightful shock to them to discover that the sort of their imagination of war, which had been fed by the classical literature of war, uh, was incorrect. The war wasn't brave and heroic. It was pretty horrible and nasty and dirty and uh, you were more concerned about keeping dry and, and keeping warm than you were about closing with the enemy. Owen was commissioned a second lieutenant and sent to join the 2nd Manchester Regiment on the Somme. He entered the trenches in the middle of the worst winter and memory. My own dear mother, I can see no excuse for deceiving you about these last four days. I have not been at the front. I have been in front of it. I held an advanced post in the middle of no man's land. The Germans knew we were staying there and decided we shouldn't. Those fifty hours were the agony of my happy life. I nearly broke down and let myself drown in the water that was slowly rising over my knees. I suppose I can endure cold and fatigue and the face-to-face -face death as well as another. But extra for me, there is the universal pervasion of ugliness. The distortion of the dead, whose unburiable bodies sit outside the dugouts. In poetry we call them glorious, but to sit with them all day, all night, and a week later to come back and find them still sitting there in motionless groups. That is what saps the soldierly spirit. Many of the soldiers had to cope with images that wouldn't go away. Many of these parts of human bodies were actually used to shore up the trench system itself. Some soldiers found it humorous uh, to hang their water canteens on a protruding arm or a protruding leg. These were not people who were disrespectful of the dead. They were living with the dead. One can imagine the possibilities of becoming numb to such images. But those who couldn't turn off their feelings, internalize them, brought them home with them, lived with them, dreamt about them, and went mad because of them. While Wilfred Owen was sleeping, a shell hit his trench, blasting him into the air and killing a fellow officer. Owen spent days trapped near the dismembered body. When finally relieved, he was found to be confused, trembling, and behaving strangely. My very dear sister, you must not entertain the least concern about me. You know, it was not the Germans that worked me up, nor the explosives, but it was living so long by poor old Cock Robin, as we used to call Second Lieutenant Kroger, who lay not only nearby, but in various places around and about, if you understand. 
Owen was diagnosed as having shell shock and sent home. He had lasted only four months.